Welcome to our Lord's house. We're celebrating the 20th Sunday after Pentecost. And over the last few weeks, we've seen how God describes people and how God describes the church. Now, we're looking at how God describes himself. We're going to see that God is patient and how he nurtures his own in to grow in their faith. We begin our worship by singing, Let Thoughtless Thousands Choose the Road, hymn 466. The thoughtless thousands choose the road that leads a soul away from God. This happiness, dear Lord, be mine to live and die entirely thine. In Christ by faith I wish to live from him my life, my all receive to him devote my flee Serve him alone with all my powers. Christ is my everlasting all. To him I look, on him I call. He will my every want supply in time and in Let us pray. Almighty God, in your bountiful goodness, keep us safe from every evil of body and soul. Make us ready with cheerful hearts to do whatever pleases you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Apostle Paul was concerned. He didn't want the people that he loved in Corinth to receive God's grace in vain. Is that even possible? Remember Jesus' parable of the sower and the seed? Only one of the four types of soil produced fruit. One had the word snatched away, and two others lost faith after it started to grow. Only one grew to maturity. It is heartbreakingly common to receive God's grace and then lose it. Paul didn't want that to happen to the people in Corinth. God doesn't want that to happen to us. So he explains that serving God will encounter resistance, require sacrifice, change your life, and be misunderstood. It also means that we work with the power of God, the weapons of righteousness, and the word of truth. The list that God had Paul write down is eye-opening, heart-wrenching, nerve-wracking, and inspiring. Serving in God's kingdom is amazing. And it's hard. With the current restrictions, we're spending more and more time separated from each other. And we can't do it alone. We need brothers and sisters in Christ to support us, to encourage us, and to share our joy. We're far more, more likely to grow in faith when we grow together. We are far less likely to receive God's grace in vain. The Apostle Paul wanted the Corinthians to share their hearts with him. God wants us to open our hearts to each other. We're family. We read from the second letter to the Corinthians that God inspired the Apostle Paul to write, chapter 6. As fellow workers... We also urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, at a favorable time I listened to you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. Look, now is the favorable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are giving no one a reason to stumble in any way so that our ministry will not be blamed. Rather, in every way we show ourselves to be God's ministers. In great endurance, in troubles, in hardships, in difficulties, in beatings, in imprisonments, in riots, in hard work, in sleepless nights, in times of hunger, 
in purity, in knowledge, in patience, in kindness, in the Holy Spirit, in sincere love, in the word of truth, in the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness on the right and on the left through glory and dishonor, through bad report and good report, treated as deceivers, yet being honest, treated as unknown, yet being well-known, as dying, yet look, we live, as punished, yet not put to death, as grieving, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing everything. We've spoken to you openly, Corinthians. Our heart is standing wide open. We have plenty of room for you. But you do not have room for us in your affections. I am speaking as to my children. In exchange, open your hearts wide too. This is the word of God. Think about what God has given us. He's given us a world with everything we need, not just to survive, but to thrive, to find joy, purpose, and fulfillment. What does God get in return? Violence, murder, selfishness, and rebellion. Now think about God's response to all that. Jesus told a parable about people who take God's world and refuse to acknowledge him. And God's response is amazing. When the owner of the vineyard sent his servants to collect what he was owed, his servants were met with increasing violence, first a beating, then a murder, then murder by stoning. We can't help but think of the treatment Jeremiah and so many of God's prophets received at the hands of their own people. So what was God's response? He sent more servants. He kept reaching out to a rebellious people. God's patience is unparalleled. His love is overwhelming. But sin doesn't stop so easily. God kept sending servants, and the people kept dealing out violence and rebellion. And what was God's response to that? He sent his only son. He knew what would happen. He knew that the people would reject, abuse, and murder his beloved son. And he would take that barbarity and use it to redeem people. Only God can do that. At the end of the parable, Jesus left a warning. Anyone who opposes him will come to a wretched end. Since Israel's leaders refused to repent, God's kingdom would be taken away from them and given to people who produce fruits of faith. Now the kingdom is ours. Let's live by faith and serve God with the, all the gifts he's given us. We read from the Apostle Matthew's first-hand account of Jesus' life, chapter 21. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. He leased it out to some tenant farmers and went away on a journey. When the time approached to harvest the fruit, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. The tenant farmers seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then the landowner sent even more servants than the first time. The tenant farmers treated them the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenant farmers saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. They took him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. So when the landowner comes, what will he do to those tenant farmers? They told him, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end. Then he will lease out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his fruit when it is due. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. 
That is why I tell you the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces its fruit. This is the gospel of our Lord. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The part of God's word we will consider together is taken from the second book of the Kings, chapter 21. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned for 55 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hephzibah. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, following the disgusting practices of the nations which the Lord had driven out before the people of Israel. He rebuilt the high places which his father Hezekiah had destroyed. He erected altars to Baal and made an Asherah pole, just as Ahab, king of Israel, had done. He bowed down to the whole army of the heavens, and he served them. He built altars in the house of the Lord, about which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem I will put my name. He built altars to all the army of the heavens in the two courtyards of the house of the Lord. He made his son pass through the fire. He practiced fortune-telling and sought omens and dealt with mediums and spiritists. He greatly increased the evil he did in the eyes of the Lord and provoked him to anger. He put an image of Asherah, which he had made, into the house about which the Lord said to David and to his son Solomon, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen from all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. I will not make the feet of Israel wander again from the land which I gave to their fathers, if they will just be careful to do whatever I commanded them and to observe the whole law which my servant Moses commanded them. But they did not listen. Manasseh led them astray so that they did more evil than the nations whom the Lord exterminated before the people of Israel. Then the Lord said through his prophets, Because Manasseh, king of Judah, has engaged in these disgusting practices and has done more evil than all that which the Amorites who had gone before him had done, and he has caused Judah to sin with his filthy idols. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Pay attention. I am bringing such disaster on Jerusalem and Judah that the ears of all who hear of it will tingle. I will stretch out over Israel the plumb line that was stretched out over Samaria and the level used on the house of Ahab. I will wipe away Jerusalem just as someone wipes a bowl clean and turns it upside down. I will hand over the remnant of my possession and give them into the hand of their enemies so that they become plunder and spoils for all their enemies. Because they have done what is evil in my eyes and have provoked me to anger from the day when their fathers came out of Egypt until today. This is the word of our Lord. Dear Christian friends, this is a story of a 12-year-old boy. 12-year-old boy who was put on the throne of Israel. But he wasn't there alone. He had God's word to guide him. But he chose to follow his own wisdom. He chose to follow the wisdom of the world. He chose to reject God. And I think one of the most amazing things in this section is God's patience. If you look at the very first verse, it says Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king and he reigned for 55 years in Jerusalem. That is the longest reign of any of the kings of Israel, any of the kings of Judah. 55 years. And he was the most evil king. So why did he get 55 years? David only got 40. And David was faithful. One of the misconceptions that I think we often carry is that longevity or apparent success is a sign of God's favor. These 55 years are a sign of God's patience. Even though Manasseh 
rebelled, led people into sin, ignored, defied, insulted, shamed God, God still took year after year after year to reach him. And the amazing thing is, it worked. At the end of Manasseh's reign, he repented. The damage had already been done. But Manasseh repented and he found grace. One of the characteristics that God wants us to recognize about himself is that he is not only forgiving, he's nurturing. And in his patience, he's working with us and he wants us to produce fruits of faith. Not so that we can be impressive, but so that people can see what God wants. They can see the love of God. They can see the forgiveness of God. They can see the peace of God. They can see the joy of God. They can see how God's people work together, worship together, sing together, encourage each other, and walk together on the path to heaven. Because if we don't, this happens. Manasseh chose not to. And the whole country suffered. In verse 2, it says, He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, following the disgusting practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the people of Israel. God's patience runs deep when we sink deeply into sin. He did more evil than the nations before him, and God still reached out to him. And the list of things that he did, these next verses, verses 3 to 8, are just a list of the things that Manasseh did, the sins, the, the, the bad choices, the leading people in, away from God and into the bowels of hell. And what's fascinating is every single one of them starts with the first commandment. There's the first commandment, and the third commandment, and the second commandment, and the sixth commandment. And if you recognize those commandments, we recognize that those are the commandments of the heart. Where do we give our heart? Where do we put our trust? Where are we going to keep our life? God tells us the best, the safest, the only place we can find life is in his hands. Manasseh chose not, chose not to. In verse 3, the first thing he did is he undid all of the good work his father Hezekiah had done. As you read through the books of Kings and Chronicles, uh, you always see that a king came in and he was a good king, but there's always that refrain, but the high places were not removed, but the high places were not removed. Well, when Hezekiah came in, he finally removed the high places so that people were worshiping the way that God wanted them to. And then here, in verse 3, he rebuilt the high places. Why? All the things that Hezekiah had done, he destroyed. He erected altars to, the, to Baal and made an Asherah pole. He bowed down to the whole army of heavens and he served them. We tend to serve what we can see. We can't see God. So it's difficult, in fact, impossible, to serve him without faith. Manasseh wanted to be like everyone else. Baal was popular. Asherah was popular because they were sexual goddesses and sexual gods. And of course, we recognize that in our culture, that's what reigns. And he bowed down to the starry hosts. Because they're impressive. There's power there. The more you learn about the stars, you recognize that God put them all out in one day. The incredible power that's up there. And Manasseh didn't know as much about them as we do. But he recognized that they were a source of power. So he built altars in the house of the Lord. 
So he's breaking the first commandment. He's giving his heart, taking his heart away from God, giving it to things that follow his own desires, and it leads to breaking the third commandment. Now God's house, about which the Lord had said, in Jerusalem I will put my name. Manasseh defiled it. And he put in altars to the army of the heavens in the two courtyards of the house of the Lord. And then, because his heart was not in the right place, he was breaking the first commandment, he also broke the second. And he broke the fourth. He made his son pass through the fire. The most likely definition of that is he sacrificed him as a burnt offering. And he practiced fortune-telling, telling omens, dealing with mediums and spiritists, looking for information, following everything but God. Looking for information from mediums and spiritists and, and omens. And fortune telling. Instead of listening to the word of the Lord. We still do that. We still listen to the wisdom of men. And ignore the wisdom of God. When human wisdom and human reason has failed over and over and over again. And God's wisdom and God's word has proved correct year after year and generation after generation. Still, we tend to go with what's familiar. So to Manasseh. Then in verse 7, he put an Asherah pole in which he had made into the house about which the Lord had said to David and to his son, in this house I will put my name forever. You consider what blessing the Israelites had. That temple that Solomon had built, God said, I will live there. And Manasseh threw that all away to put in altars for Baal and to put in a pole for Asherah. Because that appealed to human lust. That's what people wanted to do. And then in verse 8, what they lost. God said, I will put my name here forever and I will not make the feet of Israel wander again if they will just be careful to do what I commanded them and observe the whole law which my servant Moses commanded them. Moses gave them the law. He gave them the Lord's word. He said, here is what God wants for his people. And God promised, if you follow his word, he will bless you. And so it makes the tragedy all that much more poignant when they threw it all away. And I know that sounds achingly familiar. Because our country too blessed so richly by the Lord. In more and more areas of our country, they're taking God's word and throwing it away and replacing it with human wisdom. Instead of hearing what the Lord says, we hear the latest fad. We hear the latest tweet. The latest thing we see on YouTube. The latest wisdom that comes from people who don't even know what's going to happen next year. And what we have is God's eternal counsel, the word of truth, the word of life. And God says when we follow that, we will be blessed. And Israel chose, look at verse 9, they did not listen. That, too, is the greatest tragedy. In fact, it's probably happening right now. As this video is running, there's the temptation not to listen. And Manasseh led them astray. And look where it took them. Every single time when we depart from God's word, it leads to evil. And they did more evil than the nations whom the Lord exterminated before the people of Israel. God judged those people because of generation after generation of rebellion. And somehow Israel thought that wouldn't happen to them. Same way somehow we think it won't happen to us. 
when we ignore God. And so God is patient with us. He keeps reaching out to us. Listen to the word of God. Hear what he has to say and then do it. In verse 10, he said, The Lord said through his prophets, Because Manasseh, king of Judah, has engaged in these disgusting practices and has done more evil than all that which the Amorites who had gone before him had done, he said, pay attention. If you're not going to listen willingly to what the Lord says in his word, he will send judgment that you cannot ignore. In Israel's case, in Judah's case, I, will bring, I am bringing such disaster on Jerusalem and Judah that all the ears of all who hear it will tingle. He's bringing Babylon. And ba Babylon would destroy Judah, would burn Jerusalem to the ground, would take that temple that was dedicated to God and had sat there for hundreds of years and it would disappear. And God's people would lose everything then he'd have their attention but even then people chose not to admit their sin sounds familiar doesn't it and of course we want to avoid the temptation of thinking yeah i know other people who do that yes i know segments of the world who should be judged when God sent the mirror of the law so that we could see ourselves in it. Because how often do we tell God he's got to wait? How often do we tell God I'm not going to do what you say, I'm going to do what I want? How often do we excuse evil? How often do we say, well, I'm not going to do anything about that? And if we choose not to hear God's word, not to read God's word, not to live according to God's word, He'll get our attention. In verse 13, it says, I will stretch out over Israel the plumb line that was stretched out over Samaria. So they'd seen this before. The northern ten tribes had been gone for generations because they refused to repent. God sent the kingdom of Assyria and the northern ten tribes disappeared. And the one tribe that was left that tribe of Judah didn't learn. They saw that it could happen, but they thought it won't happen to us. And we've seen it happen over and over and over again. And still there's that temptation to think, it won't happen to us. Because sometimes we mistake God's patience with an unwillingness to act, or we mistake God's patience, sometimes with he doesn't exist. God is being patient with us because he wants everyone to come to repentance. Because for those who do not repent, they're judged. We start out in this world under condemnation because we start out in this world sinners. We know that. We know what's in our minds. We know what's in our hearts. We know what the next generation is going to be like. That's why we try to teach them. We've never had to teach a generation to sin. They're born experts. God wants us to teach them better than that, to rescue them from the sin that they would otherwise dive into headlong, which is exactly what Manasseh was doing. And the people of Judah gleefully followed him until God said in verse 13, I will stretch out over Israel the plumb line that was stretched out over Samaria. I will wipe away Jerusalem just as someone wipes a bowl clean and turns it upside down. And finally in verse 14, I will hand over the remnant of my possession and give them into the hand of their enemies because they have done what is evil in my eyes from the day when their fathers came out of Egypt until today. And we look at that constant sin and we think, how could they? But are we any different? 
What was the solution here? Listen to what God has to say. Because when we consider what God has to say, what God was trying to say to Manasseh and to Judah is there is forgiveness. There is blessing. Turn back to the Lord because he loves you. So when we look at this text and we see ourselves, the solution is Jesus Christ and him crucified. It's not more wisdom from the world. It's not different wisdom from the world. It's not a change in political leaders. It's the voice of our eternal God who loved us so much he sent his son to die for us who gave us his law so that we would know the difference between good and evil. And then when we looked into the law and recognized the sin that lives in us, we would recognize we need a Savior. And the tragedy is that as the years go by, more and more people do not listen. The amazing thing is that God is still patient. And he wants to work with us so that life and that forgiveness can spread from where we have it into those places where people are dying without it. Because the nature of God is patience and nurture and love and forgiveness and salvation. Amen. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, we ask that you would take special care of your children, the Beaumont family, and Milford Benke, Ashley Bordelis, and Artis Cerny, Gladys Constein, Jerry Garbrecht, Jean Harperon, Dorothy Johnson, Sally Camps, Rose Carr, Noah and Kristen Olson, Lisa Schmidt, Marjorie Urbanic, Jesse Zach. We ask that you would protect Jesse Adams and Greg Carroll and Aaron Forsberg, Dayton Godfrey, Joshua Jansen, Jesse Johnston, Patrick Knoppenberg, Aaron Stocker, Dylan Vanko, Thomas Wyrick, Aaron Wood, Steve Campbell, Greg Hemker, Raymond Cashaw, and David Peterson. Lord Jesus, in your name we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We conclude our worship with the hymn, On My Heart, Imprint Your Image. On my heart, imprint your image. Blessed Jesus, King of grace. That life's riches, cares, and pleasures Have no power to hide your face This the superscription be Jesus crucified for me Is my life my hope's foundation And my glory and salvation